volume two chapter five of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five a young lady's plot a consultation and the happy result of it a terrible interruption and a dangerous expedition confidential intercourse mary peters left agnes considerably earlier than she had intended in order to communicate to her mother a project which had entered her head during the short time they spent together though the project however was formed during their interview the idea upon which it was founded had repeatedly occurred to her before short as the time had been that was given for its ripening this idea was suggested to her by the evident admiration of mr stephenson for her friend on which she had meditated as they drove from the mall to rodney place as she brushed and papilloted her nut-brown curls before her glass and as she strolled the next morning from her own home to that of agnes it might plainly have been expressed thus frederick stephenson is over head and ears in love with agnes willoughby such was the idea but the project was concerning a much more serious matter namely that a marriage between the parties might easily be brought about and moreover that the effecting this would be one of the very best actions to which it could be possible to dedicate her endeavours to do miss peters justice she was in general neither a busybody nor a matchmaker but she was deeply touched by the melancholy feeling agnes had expressed respecting her own position she felt too both the justness of it and the utter helplessness of the poor girl herself either to change or amend it nothing but her marrying can do it thought mary and why should she not marry this young man who is so evidently smitten with her poor agnes what a change what a contrast it would be and if mamma will help me i am sure we may bring it about he is perfectly independent and violently in love already and she is a creature that appears more beautiful and more fascinating every time one sees her it was exactly when her meditations reached this point that she discovered it to be necessary that she should go home directly and home she accordingly went luckily finding her mother alone in her dressing-room i am delighted to find you by yourself mamma began mary i have a great deal to say to you and then followed a rapid repetition of all agnes had just said to her is it not a dreadful situation mamma she added so dreadful mary replied mrs peters that were not the youngest of you about three years older than herself i really think i should propose taking her as a finishing governess poor little thing what can we do for her now listen mamma answered mary raising her hand gravely as if to bespeak both silence and attention and do not i implore you mar the usefulness of what i am going to say by turning it into jest it is no jest mother mr stephenson the young man we saw last night is most certainly captivated by the beauty of agnes in no common degree i was near enough to her all the evening to see plainly how things were going on and were she less miserable in her present condition i might think it a fair subject for a jest or a bet perhaps on the chances for and against his proposing to her but as it is thinking of her as i do feeling for her as i do i think mamma that it is my duty to endeavour by every means in my power to turn these chances in her favour dearest mother will you help me but what means have you my dear girl replied mrs peters gravely i believe i share both your admiration and your pity for agnes as fully as you could desire but i really see not what there is that we can with propriety do to obtain the object you propose though i am quite aware of its value i will ask you to do nothing my dearest mother in which you shall find a shadow of impropriety would there be any in inviting this young man to your house should you chance to become better acquainted with him no but i think we must take some strangely forward steps to lead to this better acquaintance that will depend altogether upon his degree of inclination to it should he prove ritroso i consent to draw off my forces instantly but if as i anticipate he should push himself upon us as an acquaintance i want you to promise that you will not on your part defeat his wishes nay a little more perhaps i would wish you dear mother to feel with me that it would be right and righteous to promote them i rather think it would mary as you put the case agnes willoughby is by no means lowly born her father was a gentleman decidedly and i understood from my brother that the comptons though for some centuries i believe rather an impoverished race derive their small property from ancestors of very great antiquity so there is nothing objectionable on that tender point and for herself pretty creature she would certainly be an ornament and a grace as head and chieftainess of the most aristocratic establishment in the world so as a matter of conscience 
i have really no scruples at all but as a matter of convenance i can only promise not to check by any want of civility on my part whatever advances the gentleman may choose to make will this content you my little plotter yes pretty well for i am not without hope that you will warm in the cause if it goes on at all and then perhaps i shall squeeze an invitation out of you and so on and by the way mamma when are we going to have our little musical soiree i believe young de lacy is not going to stay much longer and if he goes what are we to do for our base we shall be puzzled certainly you may write the cards directly mary if you will mary rose at once to set about it but on opening a certain drawer in the commode and examining its contents she said we must send to the library mamma there are not half enough cards here besides i want you to walk with us and i want agnes to join the party may i send her a note desiring her to come to take her luncheon here i comprehend your tactics my dear agnes is to walk with us just about three o'clock when all the world are out and about we want invitation cards and may just as well when we are out go to the library for them ourselves there we shall be sure of seeing mr stephenson he will be very likely to join us etc 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 is not that your plan and if it is mamma replied mary laughing i see not that it contains anything beyond what has been agreed to by our compact very well mademoiselle talleyrand write your note this was promptly done and promptly dispatched and reached agnes about two minutes after major allen had taken his departure she was aware of his visit for betty jacks had obligingly opened her closet door to inform her of it and she now stood with the welcome note in her hand meditating on the best manner of forwarding the petition to her aunt not quite liking to send in the note itself doubtful of betty's delivering a message on the subject so as to avoid giving offence but dreading beyond all else the idea of presenting herself before the major major allen is still there jerningham is he not i have seen nothing of my aunt no miss he is this moment gone and a beautiful sweet man he is too agnes hesitated no longer but with mary's note in her hand entered the drawing-room to ask leave to obey the summons it contained she found mrs barnaby in a state of considerable but very delightful agitation the album was open before her her two elbows rested on the table and her hands shaded her eyes which were fixed on the interesting name of isabella d'almafonte in a fit of deep abstraction agnes uttered her request but was obliged to repeat it twice before the faculties of the widow were sufficiently recalled to things present for her to be able to return a coherent answer when at length however she understood what was asked she granted her permission with quite as much pleasure as agnes received it at that moment she could endure nothing but solitude or major allen and eagerly answered oh yes my dear go go i do not want you at all a liberated bird is not more quick in reaching the shelter of the desired wood than was agnes in making her way from sion row to rodney place and so great was her joy at finding herself there that for the moment she forgot all her sorrows and talked of the ball as if she had not felt infinitely more pain than pleasure there as soon as the luncheon was ended mrs peters and elizabeth mary and agnes set off upon their walk not over the hills and far away as heretofore but along the well-paved ways that led most certainly to the resorts of their fellow-mortals lucy and james having heard that the evening for their music party was fixed at the distance only of one fortnight declared that it was absolutely necessary to devote the interval to practice and therefore they remained at home if the plan of mary peters was such as her mother had described it nothing could have been more successful for even before they reached the library they met mr stevenson and colonel hubert the moment the former perceived them he stepped forward quitting the arm of his friend who certainly rather relaxed than accelerated his pace and having paid his compliments with the cordial air of an old acquaintance to mrs peters and elizabeth passed them and took his station beside agnes both she and her friend received his eager salutation with smiles mary as we know had her own motives for this and agnes had by no means forgotten how seasonably he had led her off on the preceding evening from her aunt major allen and the forsaken tea-table her bright smile however soon faded as she marked the stiff bow by which colonel hubert returned mrs peters civil recognition of him he too passed the first pair of ladies and joined himself to the second but though he bowed to both of them it seemed that he turned and again took the arm of stephenson solely for the purpose of saying to him are you going to give up your walk to the wells frederick most decidedly mon cher 
was the cavalier reply then i must wish you good morning i believe said colonel hubert attempting to withdraw his arm no don't cried the gay young man good-humouredly and retaining his arm with some show of violence i will not let you go without me you will find nothing there depend upon it to reward you on this occasion for your pertinacity of purpose colonel hubert yielded himself to this wilfulness and passively as it seemed accompanied the party into the library nothing could be more agreeable than the animated conversation of young stephenson he talked to all the ladies in turn contrived to discover a multitude of articles of so interesting a kind that it was necessary they should examine and talk about them and finally bringing forward the book of names fairly beguiled mrs peters and her daughters into something very like a little gossip concerning some among them it was while they were thus employed that colonel hubert approached agnes who of course could take no part in it and said are you going to remain long at clifton miss willoughby agnes blushed deeply as he drew near and his simple question was answered in a voice so tremulous that he pitied the agitation resulting as he supposed from their meeting in the morning which she evinced and feeling perhaps that she was not to blame because his headstrong friend was determined to fall in love with her he spoke again and in a gentler voice said i hope you have forgiven me for the blunt advice i ventured to give you this morning forgiven repeated agnes looking up at him and before her glance fell again it was dimmed by a tear i can never forget your kindness she added but so nearly in a whisper that he instantly became aware that her friends had not been made acquainted with the adventure and that it was not her wish they should be he therefore said no more on the subject but led by some impulse that seemed not certainly to proceed from either unkindness or contempt he continued to converse with her for several minutes and long enough indeed to make her very nearly forget the party of friends whose heads continued to be congregated round the librarian's register of the clifton beau monde frederick stephenson meanwhile was very ably prosecuting the object he had in view namely to establish himself decidedly as an acquaintance of mrs peters and so perfectly comme il faut in all respects was the tone of herself and her daughters that he was rapidly forgetting such a being as mrs barnaby existed and solacing his spirit by the persuasion that the only girl he had ever seen whom he could really love was surrounded by connections as elegant and agreeable as his exigeante family could possibly require nor to say truth was his friend greatly behind hand in the degree of oblivion which he permitted to fall upon his faculties respecting this object of his horror and detestation it was not very easy indeed to remember mrs barnaby while agnes awakened by a question as to what part of england it was in which she had enjoyed the rural liberty of which she had heard her speak poured forth all her ardent praise on the tranquil beauty of empton it is not she said beguiled by the attention with which he listened to her into forgetfulness of the awe he had hitherto inspired it is not so majestic in its beauty as clifton we have no mighty rocks at empton no winding river that quietly as it flows seems to have cut its own path amongst them but the parsonage is the very perfection of a soft tranquil flowery retreat where neither sorrow nor sin have any business whatever and was empton parsonage your home miss willoughby yes for five dear happy years replied agnes in an accent from which all gaiety had fled you were not born at empton then no i was only educated there but it was there at least that my heart and mind were born and i do not believe that i shall ever feel quite at home anywhere else it is rather early for you to say that is it not said colonel hubert with a smile more calculated to increase her confidence than to renew her awe may i ask how old you are i shall be seventeen in august replied agnes blushing at being obliged to confess herself so very young she might be my daughter thought colonel hubert while a shade of melancholy passed over his countenance which it puzzled agnes to interpret but he asked her no more questions and the conversation seemed languishing when frederick stephenson beginning to think that it was his turn now to talk to agnes and pretty well satisfied perhaps that he had made a favourable impression upon the peters family left the counter and the subscription book and crossed to the place where she had seated herself colonel hubert was still standing by her side but he instantly made way for his friend and had he at that moment spoken aloud the thoughts of his heart he might have been heard to say there is nothing here to justify the rejection of any family she is perfect alike in person and in mind things must take their course i will urge his departure no further 
scarcely however had these thoughts made their rapid way across his brain before his ears were assailed by the sound of a laugh which he recognized in an instant to be that of mrs barnaby a flush of heightened colour mounted to his very eyes and he felt conscience-struck as if whatever might hereafter happen to stephenson he should hold himself responsible for it because he had mentally given his consent to his remaining where the danger lay and well might the sound and sight of mrs barnaby overturn all such yielding thoughts she came more rouged more ringleted more bedizened with feathers and flowers and more loud in voice than ever she came too accompanied by major allen no thunder-cloud sending forth its flashings before it ever threw a more destructive shadow over the tranquil brightness of a smiling landscape than did this entree of the facetious pair over the happy vivacity of the party already in possession of the shop mrs peters turned very red miss willoughby turned very pale mary stopped short in the middle of a sentence and remained as mute as if she had been shot even the good-natured elizabeth looked prim and the two gentlemen though in different ways betrayed an equally strong consciousness of the change that had come over them mr stephenson put on the hat which he had laid beside him on the counter and though he drew still nearer to agnes than before it was without addressing a word to her colonel hubert immediately passed by them and left the shop this last circumstance was the only one which could at that moment have afforded any relief to agnes it at once restored her composure and presence of mind though it did not quite bring back the happy smiles with which she had been conversing five short minutes before ah my sister peters and the children here cried mrs barnaby flouncing gaily towards them i thought we should meet you what beautiful weather isn't it how do you do sir to mr stephenson i think you were among our young ladies partners last night charming ball wasn't it dear major allen do look at these bristol stones ain't they as bright as diamonds well agnes you have had your luncheon i suppose with the dear girls and now you will be able to go shopping with me we are going into bristol and i will take you with us agnes listened to her doom in silence and no more thought of appealing from it than the poor criminal who listens to his sentence from the bench but mr stephenson turned an imploring look on mrs peters which spoke so well what he wished to express that she exerted herself so far as to say we had hoped mrs barnaby that you meant to have spared agnes to us for the rest of the day and we shall be much obliged if you will leave her with us you are always very kind dear margaret returned the widow but i really want agnes just now she shall come to you however some other time good-bye good-bye we have no time to lose come agnes let's be off a silent look was all the leave-taking that passed between agnes and her greatly annoyed friends mrs barnaby took her arm under her own and as soon as they quitted the shop bestowed the other on major allen she was in high spirits which found vent in a loud laugh as soon as they had turned the corner what a stuck-up fellow that great tall colonel is major allen said she do you know anything of him if i am not greatly mistaken he is as proud as lucifer i assure you if he is proud my dear madam it must be a pride of the very lowest and vilest kind merely derived from the paltry considerations of family and fortune for entre nous he is very far from having been a distinguished officer the duke of wellington indeed has always been most ridiculously partial to him but you lowering his voice you are a pretty tolerable judge of what his good opinion is worth yes yes major i shall never be taken in there again why agnes how you drag child i shall be tired to death before i get to bristol if you walk so will the young lady take my other arm said the major thank you dear major you are very kind go round agnes and take the major's arm no i thank you aunt i do not want any arm i will walk beside you if you please without taking hold of you at all nonsense child that will look too particular major said the widow turning to him upon which without waiting further parley major allen dropped the arm he held and gaily placed himself between the two ladies saying now then fair ladies i have an arm for each agnes felt the greatest possible longing to run away but whether it would have strengthened into a positive resolution to do so upon once more feeling the touch of the major's hand which upon her retreating he very vigorously extended towards her it is impossible to say 
for at that moment the sound of a rapidly advancing pair of boots was heard on the pavement behind them and in the next mr stephenson was at her side he touched his hat to mrs barnaby and then addressing agnes said if you are going to walk to bristol i hope you will permit me to accompany you for i am going there too agnes very frankly replied thank you and without a moment's hesitation accepted the arm he offered i am sure you are very obliging mr stephenson said mrs barnaby and we shall certainly be able to walk with much greater convenience i think you two had better go before and then we can see that you don't run off you know this lively sally was followed by a gay little tittering on the part both of the major and the lady as they stood still for mr stephenson and the suffering agnes to pass them the young man seemed to have lost all his vivacity he spoke very little and even that little had the air of being uttered because he felt obliged to say something poor agnes was certainly in no humour for conversation and would have rejoiced in his silence had it not made her feel that whatever might be the motive for his thus befriending her he derived no pleasure from it ere they had walked a mile however an accident occurred which effectually roused him from the dejection that appeared to have fallen upon his spirits a herd of bullocks met them on the road one of which overdriven and irritated by a cur that worried him darted suddenly from the road up to the path and made towards them with its horns down and its tail in the air on seeing this the young man seized agnes in his arms and sprang with her down the bank into the road the animal whose object was rather to leave an enemy behind him than to do battle with any other passed on towards the major and his fair companion who were at a considerable distance behind leaving agnes trembling indeed and somewhat confused but quite unhurt and full of gratitude for the prompt activity that had probably saved her as soon as she had in some degree recovered her composure she turned back to ascertain how her aunt had fared mr stephenson assiduously attending her and they presently came within sight of a spectacle that had any mirth been in them must have drawn it forth major allen by no means approving the style in which the animal appeared inclined to charge them had instantly perceived as mr stephenson had done before that the only means of getting effectually out of its way was by jumping down the bank which at that point was considerably higher than it was a few hundred yards farther on nevertheless though neither very light nor very active he might have achieved the descent well enough had he been alone but what was he to do with mrs barnaby she uttered a piercing cry and threw herself directly upon his bosom exclaiming save me major save me in this dilemma the major proved himself an old soldier to shake off the lady he felt in every sense of the word was quite impossible but there was no reason that she should stifle him and therefore grasping her with great ardour he half carried half pushed her towards the little precipice and skilfully placing himself so that if they fell she should fall first he cried out manfully now spring and spring they did but in such a sort that the lady measured her length in the dust a circumstance that greatly broke the major's fall for although he made a considerable effort to roll beyond her he finally pitched with his knees full upon her thus lessening his descent very materially when the young people reached them they had both recovered their equilibrium but not their composure major allen was placed with one knee in the dust and on the other supporting mrs barnaby who with her head reclining on his shoulder seemed to have a very strong inclination to indulge herself with a fainting fit her gay dress was lamentably covered with dust her feathers broken and hanging distressingly over her eyes and her whole appearance as well as that of the hero who supported her forlorn and dejected in the extreme are you hurt aunt said agnes approaching her hurt am i hurt gracious heaven what a question if my life be spared i shall consider it little short of a miracle oh major allen she continued with a burst of sobbing where should i have now been but for you trampled or tossed mrs barnaby trampled or tossed to death decidedly replied the major not wishing to lessen her sense of obligation yet restrained by the presence of witnesses from expressing his feelings with all the ardour he might otherwise have shown most true most true she replied never shall i be able to express the gratitude i feel can you not stand up aunt said agnes whose cheeks were crimsoned at the absurdity of the scene how will you be able to get home if you cannot stand god knows child god only knows what is yet to become of me oh major i trust myself wholly to you 
poor agnes uttered a sound not much unlike a groan upon which mr stephenson on whom it fell like a spur urging him to save her from an exhibition so painfully ridiculous for it was quite evident that mrs barnaby was not really hurt proposed that he should escort miss willoughby with all possible speed back to clifton and dispatch thence a carriage to bring mrs barnaby home major allen who desired nothing more ardently than to get rid of him seconded the proposal vehemently you are quite right sir it is the only thing to be done he said and if you will hasten to perform this i will endeavour so to place mrs barnaby as to prevent her suffering any great inconvenience while waiting till the carriage shall arrive ought i not to remain with my aunt said agnes to mr stephenson but in a whisper that was heard only by himself in my opinion you certainly ought not he replied in the same tone believe me he added i have many reasons for saying so nothing but her earnest desire to do that whatever it might be which was the least improper for that as she truly felt was all that was left her could have induced agnes to propose inflicting so terrible a penance on herself but strangely as she was obliged to choose her counsellor there was a grave seriousness in his manner which convinced her he had not answered her lightly and therefore as her aunt said not a word to detain her she set off on her return with as much speed as she could use saying as she departed depend upon it aunt there shall be no delay mr stephenson again offered her his arm but she now declined it and the young man for some time walked silently by her side wishing to speak to her yet honestly doubting his own power of doing so with the composure he desired at length however the silence became embarrassing and he broke it by saying with something of abruptness will you forgive me miss willoughby if i venture to forget for a moment how short a time it is since i have had the happiness of knowing you will you forgive me if i speak to you like a friend indeed i will and be very thankful too replied agnes composedly for his manner had taught her to feel assured that she had no cause to fear him you are very kind he resumed with some little embarrassment but i feel that it is taking an almost unwarrantable liberty and were it not that this walk offers an opportunity which i think i ought not to lose i might perhaps endeavour to say what i wish to mrs peters i allude to major allen miss willoughby i wish you could lead your aunt to understand that he is not a person fit for your society though he is probably a stranger here he is well known elsewhere as a needy gambler and in short a most unprincipled character in every way good heaven exclaimed agnes what shall i do can you not venture to hint this to your aunt said he she would probably be very angry replied agnes with spontaneous frankness but what is worse than that she would i know insist upon my telling her where i heard it say you heard it from me miss willoughby replied the young man new as agnes was to the world and its ways she felt that there was something very honourable and frank in this proceeding and it produced so great a degree of confidence in return that she answered in a tone of the most unembarrassed friendliness will you give me leave mr stephenson to repeat this to mrs peters and mary they will know so much better than i do what use to make of it indeed i think you are right he replied eagerly and then the anger that you speak of will not fall on you it will not in that case i think fall on any one said agnes my aunt has fortunately a great respect for mrs peters and if anybody can have influence over her mind she may can it be wondered at if after this the conversation went on improving in its tone of ease and confidence it had begun on the side of the young man with a very sincere resolution not to suffer his admiration for his lovely companion to betray him into a serious attachment to one so unfortunately connected but before they reached sigh and row he had arrived at so perfect a conviction that he could nowhere find so pure-minded and right-thinking a being to share his fortune and to bless his future life that he only refrained from telling her so from a genuine feeling of respect which perhaps the proudest peeress in the land might have failed to inspire no thought he it is not now while she is compelled by accident to walk beside me that i will pour out my heart and all its love before her but the time shall come agnes ere they parted again appealed to him for his opinion whether she ought to go in the carriage sent to meet her aunt no indeed i think not he replied has she no maid miss willoughby who could go for her oh yes exclaimed agnes greatly relieved i can send jerningham sweet creature whispered the enamoured frederick to his heart what a delicious task to advise to guide to cherish such a being as that 
his respectful bow at parting the earnest silent lingering look he fixed upon her fair face ere he turned from the door that was open to receive her might have said much to a heart on the qui vive to meet his half-way but agnes did not observe it she was looking up towards the windmill and thinking of her early morning walk and its termination End of chapter five volume two chapter six of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six the reader is led into a secret and the young lady's plot proved to be of no avail a judicious mode of obtaining information a happy and very well timed meeting well mary i suppose you are wishing yourself joy on the success of your plottings and plannings said mrs peters to her daughter about ten days after this memorable walk on the bristol road for during that interval much had occurred that seemed to promise success to her wishes in fact frederick stephenson had quietly become a regular visitor at rodney place and the power of agnes to accept the constant invitations which brought her there likewise increased in exact proportion to the widow's growing delight in the tete-a-tete -tete visits of the major the friendly hint of mr stephenson had produced no effect whatever excepting indeed that it tended greatly to increase the tone of friendly intercourse between the peters family and himself he had released agnes from the task of mentioning the matter at all and took an early opportunity of confiding to mrs peters his ideas on the subject she received the communication with the gratitude it really deserved but confessed that mrs barnaby was a person so every way disagreeable to her that the task of attempting to guide her would be extremely repugnant to her feelings but miss willoughby said frederick it is for her sake that one would wish to keep this odious woman from exposing herself to ruin and disgrace if possible and for her sake i will do it answered mrs peters she is as deserving of all care as her aunt is unworthy of it this reply convinced mr stephenson that mrs peters was one of the most discerning as well as most amiable women in the world but no other advantage arose from the praiseworthy determination of the dear margaret for when that lady said to her gravely at the very first opportunity she could find pray mrs barnaby do you know anything of that major allen's private character the answer she received was yes mrs peters a great deal and more probably than any other person whatever at clifton and i know too that there are agents paid hired agents employed in circulating the most atrocious lies against him i am not one of them i assure you madam said mrs peters abruptly leaving her seat and determined never again to recur to the subject a comfortable resolution to which she reconciled her conscience by remembering the evident devotion of mr stephenson to agnes the symptoms of which were daily becoming less and less equivocal it was within a few hours of this short colloquy with the widow that mrs peters thus addressed her daughter well mary i suppose you are wishing yourself joy on the success of your plottings and plannings why yes replied mary i think we are getting on pretty well and unless i greatly mistake it will be the fault of agnes and of no one else if she suffers much more from being under the protection of our precious aunt barnaby mrs peters and mary were perfectly right in their premises but utterly wrong in their conclusion mr stephenson was indeed passionately in love with agnes and had already fully made up his mind to propose to her so soon as their acquaintance had lasted long enough to render such a step decently permissible which according to his calculations would be in about a fortnight after he had first danced with her in short he was determined to find a favourable opportunity on the evening of mrs peters promised music-party to declare his passion to her for he had already learned to know that few occasions offer in the ordinary intercourse of society more favourable for a tete-a-tete -tete than a crowded concert-room thus far therefore the observations and reasonings of agnes's watchful friends were perfectly correct but alas they saw only the surface of things there was an undercurrent running the other way of which they never dreamed and of which even had it been laid open to their view they would neither have been able to comprehend or believe the power as to the heart of agnes by some strange fatality they had never taken it into their consideration at all or at any rate had conceived it so beyond all doubt inclined the way they wished that no single word or thought amidst all their deliberations was ever bestowed upon it but the heart of agnes was fixedly devotedly and for ever given to another no wonder indeed that such an idea had never suggested itself to her friends for who could that other be 
could it be james her first partner her first walking companion and very nearly the first young man she had ever spoken to in her life assuredly not for had she been asked she could not have told whether his eyes were blue or black hardly whether he were short or tall and certainly not whether she had seen him twenty times or only twelve since their first meeting who then could it be there was but one other person whom the accidents of the last important fortnight had thrown constantly in her way and mrs peters and mary would as soon have thought that the young agnes had conceived a passion for the pope as for the stately proud reserved colonel hubert yet she could and if she would have told her how far above all other mortals his noble head rose proudly she could have told that on his lofty brow her soul read volumes she could have told that in the colour of his thoughtful eye the hue of heaven seemed deepened into black by the rich lash that shaded it all this she could have told and moreover could have counted with most faithful arithmetic not only how many times she had seen him but how many times his eyes had turned towards her how many times he had addressed a word to her how many smiles had been permitted to cheer her heart how many frowns had chilled her spirit as they passed over his countenance little could any one have guessed all this but so it was and frederick stephenson with all his wealth his comeliness and kind heart to boot had no more chance of being accepted as a husband by the poor dependent agnes willoughby than the lowest hind that ploughs the soil by the proudest lady that owns it meanwhile my real heroine the widow barnaby thought little of agnes or any other lady but herself and less still perhaps of mr stephenson or any other gentleman but the major the affair on the bristol road though injurious to her dress and rather dusty and in some degree disagreeable at the time had wonderfully forced on the tender intimacy between them yet mrs barnaby was not altogether so short-sighted as bystanders might suppose and though she freely permitted herself the pleasure of being made love to she determined to be very sure of the major's rent-roll before she bestowed herself and her fortune upon him for notwithstanding her flirting propensities the tender passion had ever been secondary in her heart to a passion for wealth and finery and not the best behaved and most discreet dowager that ever lived was more firmly determined to take care of herself and make a good bargain if she ever married again then was our flighty flirting widow barnaby she was fully aware that many difficulties lay in the way of her getting the information she wanted in the first place she had no acquaintance except the peterses who were his declared enemies and she loved both justice and the major too well to let his happiness which was now avowedly dependent upon her accepting his hand rest on such doubtful testimony and secondly there was considerable caution required in the manner of asking questions so special as those she wished to propose lest they might reach the ears of her lover and it was necessary if the tender affair finally terminated in wedlock that it should be brought about without any appearance on her side of such sordid views lest a suspicion might arise on his that her own wealth was not quite so great as she wished him to believe respecting settlements she had already decided upon what she should propose she would make over the whole of her fortune unconditionally to him provided he would make her a settlement of one poor thousand a year for life in return some days passed away after the major had actually proposed and been conditionally accepted in case a few weeks longer acquaintance confirmed their affection before mrs barnaby had discovered any method by which she might satisfy her anxious curiosity respecting the actual state of major allen's affairs during this time she was willing to allow even to herself that her affections were very deeply engaged but yet she steadfastly adhered to her resolution of not bestowing upon him the blessing of her hand till she learned from some one besides himself that he was a man of large fortune at length when almost in despair of meeting with any one whom she could trust on such a subject it occurred to her that betty jacks who had not only continued to grow till she was nearly as tall as her mistress but had made such proficiency in the ways of the world since she left silverton as rendered her exceedingly acute might make acquaintance with major allen's groom and learned from him what was generally considered to be the amount of his master's income the idea had hardly struck her before she determined to put it in execution and having rung the bell betty after the usual interval that it took her to climb from the kitchen stood before her come in jerningham said mrs barnaby and shut the door i have something particular that i wish to say to you betty anticipated a scolding and looked sulky i am very well satisfied with you jerningham resumed the lady 
and i called you up chiefly to say that you may have the cap with the pink ribbons that i put off yesterday morning thank you ma'am said betty turning to go stay a moment jerningham i have something i want to talk to you about betty advanced and took hold of the back of the chair to support her lengthy person a habit which she had fallen into from the frequent long confidential communications her lady was accustomed to hold with her pray jerningham do you know major allen's groom inquired mrs barnaby in a gentle voice lor no ma'am how should i come for to know his groom nay my good girl there would be no harm in it if you did i have remarked that he is a particularly smart respectable-looking servant and i must say i think it would be quite as well if such a good-looking girl as you did make acquaintance with the servant of a gentleman like major allen it would give you a proper protector and companion jerningham in a sunday evening walk or anything of that kind and really it looks as if he did not think you worth noticing considering how intimate the two families are become oh for that ma'am i don't believe the young man would have any objection and i don't mean to say as how i never spoke to him replied betty very well jerningham that is just what i wanted to know because if you are sufficiently acquainted to speak such a sharp clever girl as you are would find it easy enough to improve the intimacy and that's what i want you to do jerningham and then i want you some fine evening perhaps after i've had my tea to let him take a walk with you and when you are talking of one thing and the other i want you to find out whether his master is reckoned a rich gentleman or a poor one do you understand jerningham betty jack's black eyes kindled into very keen intelligence at this question and she answered with very satisfactory vivacity yes ma'am i understands well then set about it as soon as you can and remember jerningham if he asks any questions about me that you make him understand my fortune is a great deal larger than it appears to be which it really is you know only just now i am travelling quietly by way of a change if you do all this cleverly and well i will give you my old parasol which only wants a stitch or two to make it quite fit to use thank you ma'am i could find him in a minute at the beer-shop if you like it well then do so my good girl and you may say if you will that you could take a walk with him this evening the arrangement was probably made without great difficulty for on the following morning betty was ready with her report any detailed account of the interview between the major's man and the widow's woman would be unnecessary as the girl's account of it was what principally affected the interests of our widow and that shall be faithfully given betty jacks made her appearance in the drawing-room as soon as agnes had left it after breakfast with that look of smirking confidence which usually enlivens the countenance of a soubrette when she knows she has something to say worth listening to her anxious mistress instantly saw that the commission had not been in vain well jerningham she cried with a deep respiration that was more like panting than sighing what news do you bring me all that is best and honourablest for the major ma'am his man william says that he is a noble gentleman every way with plenty of money to spend and plenty of spirit to spend it with and that happy will the lady be who wins his heart and comes to the glory and honour of being his wife that is enough jerningham said the happy mrs barnaby you seem to have behaved extremely well and with a great deal of cleverness and as i see i may trust to your good sense and prudent behaviour i will give you leave to go to the play at bristol and will give you a gallery ticket any evening that the major's worthy and faithful servant may like to take you indeed i should not mind giving him a gallery ticket too and so you may tell him betty jacks turned her head to look out of the window and a furtive sort of smile kindled in her eye for a moment but she thanked her mistress for her kindness and then made her exit with great decorum it was just two days after this that mrs barnaby yielded to major allen's request that she would taste the air of a delicious morning by taking a little turn with him in the mall twice had they enjoyed the sunny length of the pavement indulging in that sort of tender conversation which their now fully avowed mutual attachment rendered natural when in making their third progress they were met by a gentleman somewhat younger than the major but with much his style of dress and whiskered fashion who the instant he saw major allen uttered a cry of joy ran towards him and caught his hand which he not only shook affectionately but even pressed to his heart with an air of the most touching friendship my dearest maintree exclaimed the major what an unexpected pleasure is this when did you reach england what brings you here 
then suddenly recollecting himself he turned to mrs barnaby and entreated her forgiveness for the liberty he had taken in thus stopping her but i well know he added that your generous heart will find an excuse for me in its own warm feelings when i tell you that captain maintry is the oldest friend i have in the world the oldest and the dearest we have served together mrs barnaby we have fought side by side through many a well-contested field and since universal peace has sheathed our swords we have shared each other's hospitality hunted on each other's ground studied nature and mankind together and in a word have lived and loved as brothers and yet we have now been parted for two years a large property has devolved to him from his mother's family in westphalia and the necessity of attending to his farms and his signioral privileges has separated him thus long from his friend you will forgive me then my beloved martha maintry from thee i can hide nothing you have told me a thousand times that i should never be brought to resign my freedom to mortal woman look here and tell me if you can wonder that such vaunting independence can attach to me no longer nothing could be more kind than mrs barnaby's reply to this nothing more gracious than captain maintry's flattering answer and the next minute they were all walking on together as if already united by the tenderest ties many interesting questions and answers passed between the two gentlemen concerning absent friends of high rank and great distinction as well as some good-natured friendly questions on the part of captain maintry relative to many of the major's principal tenants in yorkshire as honourable to the kind feelings of the inquirer as to the good conduct and respectability of the worthy individuals inquired for after all this had lasted most agreeably for some time captain maintry suddenly paused and said to his friend my dear allen the pleasure of seeing you and the unexpected introduction to this honoured lady have together turned my brain i believe or i should have told you at once that i have brought letters from prince hurstenberg for you which require an immediate answer i never heard one man speak of another as he does of you allen he declares you are the most noble character he ever met with in any country and that is no light thing for such a man as the prince to say his letter is to ask whether you can spare him a hunting mare of your own breeding and three couple of those famous pointers for which your principal estate is so celebrated he made me promise that i would see that you sent off an answer by the first post for if you cannot oblige him in this he must apply elsewhere you know his passion for la chasse and he must not be disappointed come my dear fellow tear yourself away from this attractive lady for one short hour and then the business will be done certainly not till i have seen mrs barnaby safely home replied the major gravely then you will be too late for the post we have told mrs barnaby that we are brothers let her see you treat me as such trust her to my care i will escort her to her own home while you go for an hour or so to yours i have left the packet with your faithful william by the by i am glad to see that you still retain that capital good fellow about you an honest servant is worth his weight in gold mrs barnaby there allen you see i am in possession of the lady's arm so you may be off and i will join you as soon as i have escorted her to her quarters most cordially do i congratulate my friend madam said captain maintry as soon as major allen had taken his leave on the happy prospects that have opened before him to see you and not appreciate his felicity is impossible friendship may conquer envy but it cannot render us blind nor is it major allen alone whom i must congratulate permit me to indulge my feelings towards that long-tried and dear valued friend by telling you mrs barnaby that you are a very happy woman indeed such worth such honour as rarely alas too rarely met with in man and then he has such a multitude of minor good qualities as i may call them such an absence of all ostentation nobody would believe from his manner of living that he possessed one of the finest estates in yorkshire yet such is the fact his courage too is transcendently great and his temper the sweetest in the world yet this man mrs barnaby great and good as he is has not been able to escape enemies you have no idea of the lies that have been put in circulation concerning him by those who envy his reputation and hate his noble qualities i know it captain maintry but too well replied mrs barnaby but a woman who could be influenced by such idle and malevolent reports would be unworthy to become his wife and for myself i can assure you that far from its producing the desired effect upon me such malignity only binds me to him more closely 
there spoke a heart worthy of him fervently exclaimed the captain and i doubt not my dearest madam that these generous feelings will be put to the proof for i blush for my species as i say it there are many who when they hear of his approaching happiness will put every sort of wickedness in action to prevent it this conversation with a few little amiable sentiments in addition from both parties brought them to the door of the widow's home when captain maintry resisted her invitation to enter upon the plea that he must devote every moment he could command to his friend as unhappily he was obliged to return to bath on business of the greatest importance with as little delay as possible after this it was quite in vain that even the amiable soft-hearted elizabeth who had grown exceedingly ashamed by the by of her speaking acquaintance with major allen it was in vain that even she ventured to hint that she believed major allen was no longer invited anywhere mrs barnaby knew all about it on better authority than any one else and she quietly made up her mind to leave clifton and proceed to cheltenham as speedily as possible in order that her marriage within seven months of her husband's death might not take place under the immediate observation of his nearest relations End of chapter six volume two chapter seven of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven transient happiness an accident leading to the discovery of an unknown talent in miss willoughby and unexpected appreciation of it in colonel hubert some reflections on the peculiarities of the female mind it must be remembered that all these interesting particulars respecting the affairs of mrs barnaby's heart were perfectly unknown both to agnes and her friends it had indeed been quite as much as the posthumous affection of mrs peters for her brother could achieve to endure with some appearance of civility the advances of his widow towards intimacy but to pursue her with attentions when she seemed desirous of escaping them was quite beyond her strength and courage so rejoicing in the effect without investigating the cause she permitted her to keep herself within the retirement of her own drawing-room without ever seeking the reason of her so doing treacherous as was this interval of calm it was productive of most exquisite happiness to poor agnes while it lasted delightful walks abundance of books lively conversation and a thousand flattering marks of kindness from everybody who came near her formed a wonderful contrast to the vulgar brow-beating of her selfish aunt and even to the best joys of her solitary closet but it was an interval delusive in every way mrs peters had no suspicion that her brother's widow within seven months after his death was on the eve of marriage with a penniless swindler agnes had no suspicion that she was herself desperately in love with colonel hubert or that mr stephenson was desperately in love with her colonel hubert began to think that as he saw agnes constantly with the peters family and no longer saw mrs barnaby at all the connection between them was neither so permanent nor so injurious as he had supposed and therefore that he would act more prudently by letting matters take their course than by any further interference convinced that if frederick did choose a wife for himself instead of permitting his friends to choose for him he would never find a woman more likely to do him honour than miss willoughby there were moreover some other delusions under which he laboured both as to his own feelings and those of others but for the present he was destined like the rest of the party among whom he lived to remain enveloped in a mist of error and misconception poor stephenson more fatally deluded than all of them guessed not that he was standing on a pinnacle of hope from whence he was soon to be dashed a thousand fathom deep into the whirlpool of despair in short preparations for the music party went on very prosperously while Quote, malignant fate sat by and smiled end quote, at all that was to happen before that music party was over mrs peters confessed after a little battling the point with her family that it would be impossible to avoid sending a card of invitation to mrs barnaby and sent it was when as she said herself her virtue was rewarded by receiving through agnes a message in return expressing much regret that a previous engagement must prevent its being accepted on the morning of the day fixed for this party agnes remained in her closet at least one hour beyond the time at which it was now her daily custom to set off for rodney place some little preparation for her evening appearance requiring attention when at length she arrived there she found a note desiring her to sit down and wait for the return of the ladies who after remaining at home till beyond her usual time of coming had all driven to bristol to execute sundry errands of importance 
on reading this note agnes walked upstairs to the drawing-room which she found uncarpeted in preparation for the music of the evening and a grand piano forte standing in the middle of it now it so happened that notwithstanding the constant visits of agnes in rodney place and the general love of music which reigned there she had never been asked if she could play or sing and had never by any chance done either there are some houses and very pleasant ones too in their way in which music is considered by the family as a sort of property belonging of right to them en portage with professors indeed but with which no one else can interfere at least within their precincts without manifest impertinence the house of mrs peters was one of these james who as we have seen was an exceedingly amiable young man never did anything from morning to night if he could help it but practise on the violoncello and sing duets with his sister lucy miss peters was the only one who shared not in the talent or the monopoly for elizabeth played the harp and lucy sang and accompanied herself on the piano during by far the greater part of every day agnes was delighted by their performance and though she longed once more to touch the keys herself and perhaps to hear her own sweet voice again she had never found courage sufficient to enable her to ask permission to do so when therefore she found herself perfectly alone with the tempting instrument before her and a large collection of music placed beside it she eagerly applied her hand to try if it were open it yielded to her touch and in a moment her hands were running over the keys with that species of ecstasy which a young enthusiast in the science always feels after having been long deprived of the use of an instrument agnes played correctly and with great taste and feeling but she could by no means compete with lucy peters as an accomplished pianist she had enjoyed neither equal practice nor equal instruction but there was one branch of the gay science in which she excelled her far beyond the reach of comparison for agnes had a voice but rarely equalled in any country of the pre-eminence of her power she was herself profoundly ignorant and if she preferred hearing her own glorious notes to those of any other voice which had yet reached her she truly believed it was because there was such a very great pleasure in hearing one's self sing an opinion that had been considerably strengthened by her observations on lucy it was with very great delight unquestionably that agnes now listened to the sounds she made the size of the room the absence of the carpet the excellence and the isolation of the instrument were all advantages she had not enjoyed before and her pleasure was almost childish in its ecstasy she let her rich voice run like the lark's into wanton playfulness of ornament and felt her own power with equal joy and surprise but when this first outpouring of her youthful spirit was over she more soberly turned to the volumes beside her and hesitating a moment between the gratification of exploring new regions of harmony with an uncertain step and that of going through with all the advantages of her present accessories what had so often enchanted her without them she chose the last and fixing on a volume of handel which had been the chief source from which the old-fashioned but classic taste of mr wilmot had made her master draw her subjects of study she more soberly set about indulging herself with one of his best-loved airs the notes of angels ever bright and fair then swelled gloriously through the unpeopled room and lord remember david followed after this she changed her hand and the sparkling music of comus seemed to make the air glad as she caroled through its delicious melodies amidst all this luxury of sound it is not surprising that the knocker or the bell should give signal either of the return of the family or the approach of some visitor without the fair minstrels being aware of it this in fact occurred and with a result that had she been in the secret would have converted the clear notes of her happy song into inarticulate suspirations of forced breath colonel hubert had promised his friend frederick when they parted at the breakfast-table to join him at rodney place as he had often within the last few days done before for the purpose of joining the party in their usual morning walk but frederick had arrived there so early that he had handed mrs peters and her daughters into their carriage when they set off for bristol and then turned from the door in despair of seeing agnes for some hours having sought his friend hubert and missed him he betook himself to a gallop on the downs by way of beguiling the time till two o'clock when he intended to make another attempt to meet her by joining the luncheon party on mrs peters return colonel hubert meanwhile knocked at that lady's door exactly at the moment when the happy performer in the drawing-room was giving full license to her magnificent voice in a passage of which he had never before felt the power and majesty 
colonel hubert stopped short in the midst of the message he was leaving and the butler who opened the door to him and who by this time knew him as one of the most honoured guests of the mansion stepped back smiling into the hall a sort of invitation for him to enter which he had no inclination to refuse he accordingly stepped in and the door was closed behind him pray who is it that is singing inquired the colonel as soon as the strain ended i think sir it must be miss willoughby for i have let in nobody else since the ladies went replied the man miss willoughby repeated colonel hubert unconsciously miss willoughby impossible i think sir by the sound rejoined the servant that one of the drawing-room doors must be open and if you would please to walk up colonel you might hear it quite plain without disturbing her if colonel hubert had a weakness it was his unbounded love for music though even here he had proved his power of conquering inclination when he thought it right to do so when quite a young man he had been tempted by this passion to give so much time to the study of the violin as to interfere materially with all other pursuits a friend greatly his senior and possessing his highest esteem pointed out to him very strongly the probable effect of this upon his future career the next time the beloved professor arrived to give colonel hubert a lesson he made him a present of his violin and gave up the pursuit for ever but not the love for it that nature had implanted beyond the power of will to eradicate in short this invitation from mrs peters butler was too tempting to be resisted and nodding his approval of it to the man he walked softly up the stairs and found as that sagacious person had foreseen that the door of the back drawing-room was open colonel hubert entered very cautiously for the folding doors between the two apartments were partly open also but he was fortunate enough to glide unseen behind one of its large batons the rising hinges of which were in such a position as to permit him without any danger of being discovered to see as well as hear the unsuspicious agnes poor girl could she have been conscious of this her agitation would have amounted to agony and yet no imaginable combination of circumstances could have been so favourable to the first the dearest the most secret wish of her heart which was that when she lost sight of him which she must soon do as she well believed for ever he might not think her too young too trifling too contemptible ever to recall her to his memory again there was perhaps no great danger of this before but now it could neither be hoped nor feared that colonel hubert should ever forget what he during these short moments heard and saw there is perhaps no beautiful woman who sings well who would not appear to greater advantage if thus furtively looked at and listened to than when performing conscious of the observation of all around her but to agnes this advantage was in the present instance great indeed for never before had he seen her beautiful countenance in the full play of bright intelligence and unrestrained enthusiasm and never had he imagined that she could sing at all she was lovely radiant inspired and colonel hubert was in a fair way of forgetting equally that she was the chosen of his friend the niece of mrs barnaby and that he was just twenty years her senior when the house door was assailed by the footman's authoritative rap and the moment after the ladies voices as they ran up the stairs effectually awakened him to the realities of his situation he now for the first time felt conscious that this situation had been obtained by means not perfectly justifiable and that an apology was certainly called for and must be made he therefore retraced his steps but with less caution through the still open door and meeting mrs peters just as she reached the top of the stairs said in a voice perhaps somewhat less steady than usual will you forgive me mrs peters and plead for my forgiveness elsewhere when i confess to you that i have stolen upstairs and hid myself for at least half an hour in your back drawing-room for the purpose of hearing miss willoughby sing she is herself quite ignorant of this delay and when you pronounce to her my guilt i hope at the same time you will recommend me to mercy miss willoughby singing exclaimed mrs peters surely you must be mistaken colonel hubert agnes never sang in her life agnes singing oh no cried lucy that is quite impossible i assure you and what says the young lady herself replied colonel hubert as agnes came forward to meet her friends but she was assailed with such a clamorous chorus of questions that it was some time before she in the least understood what had happened to the reiterated have you really been singing agnes do you really sing how is it possible we never found out and the like she answered quietly enough i sing a little and i have been trying to amuse myself while waiting for you 
but when mrs peters laughingly added and do you know my dear that colonel hubert has been listening to you from the back drawing-room all the time all semblance of composure vanished she first coloured violently and then turned deadly pale and totally unable to answer sat down on the nearest chair instinctively to prevent herself from falling but with little or no consciousness of what she was about colonel hubert watched her with an eye which seemed bent upon reading every secret of the heart that so involuntarily betrayed its own agitation but what he saw or thought he saw there seemed infectious for he too lost all presence of mind and quickly approaching her with heightened colour and a voice trembling from irrepressible feeling he said have i offended you forgive me oh forgive me there was a word of eloquence in the look with which she met his eyes innocent unpractised unconscious as it was it raised a tumult in the noble soldier's breast which it cost many a day's hard struggle afterwards to bring to order but nobody saw it nobody guessed it the whole bevy of kind-hearted ladies were filled from the crown to the toe with the hope and belief that frederick stephenson and agnes willoughby were born for each other and they explained all the agitation they now witnessed by saying did any one ever see so shy a creature how foolish you are to be frightened about it agnes and come my dear child get the better of this foolish terror and if you can sing let us have the pleasure of hearing you that's right mamma said lucy laughing make her sing one song before we go down to luncheon it is not at all fair that colonel hubert should be the only person in the secret sing us a song at once there's a dear girl said mrs peters seating herself upon a sofa indeed indeed ma'am i cannot sing replied agnes clasping her hands as if begging for her life upon my word this is a very pretty mystery said mary the gentleman declares that he has been listening to her singing this half hour and the lady protests that she cannot sing at all permit me mamma to examine the parties face to face if i understand you rightly colonel hubert you stated positively that you heard miss willoughby sing will you give me leave to ask you in what sort of manner she sang in a manner miss peters replied colonel hubert endeavouring to recover his composure that i have seldom or never heard equalled in any country she sings most admirably good very good said mary a perfectly clear and decisive evidence and now miss willoughby give me leave to question you if i mistake not you told us about five minutes ago that you possessed not the power of singing in any manner at all not at this moment mary certainly replied agnes rallying and infinitely relieved by perceiving that the overwhelming emotion under which she had very nearly fainted had neither been understood nor even remarked by any one then will you promise said lucy with tant soit peu of new-born rivalry will you promise to sing for us to-night you do not mean at your concert do you lucy replied agnes laughing and why not said lucy colonel hubert declares that you sing admirably colonel hubert is very kind to say so answered agnes while rather more than her usual delicate bloom returned to her cheeks but he would probably change his opinion were he to hear me sing before a large party i am too hungry to battle the point now agnes said mrs peters so let us come down to luncheon but remember my dear if you really can sing if it be only some easy trifling ballad i shall not take it well of you if you refuse for i am sorry to say there is a terrible falling off among our performers i find three excuses since since i went out and i met miss roberts just now our prima donna after lucy who says she is so hoarse that she doubts if she shall be able to sing a note this was said as the party descended the stairs so that agnes escaped without being obliged to answer at which she greatly rejoiced as refusal or acquiescence seemed alike impossible colonel hubert stopped at the door of the dining-room wished the party good morning and persisted in making his retreat though much urged by mrs peters to join their meal but he was in no mood for it he wanted to be alone he wanted in solitude to question and if possible to understand his own feelings and with one short look at agnes he left them slipped a crown into the hand of the butler who opened the door for him and set off for a long walk over durndham downs taking as it happened exactly the same path as that in which he had met agnes a fortnight before as soon as he was gone another rather clamorous assault was made on agnes upon the subject of her having so long kept her power of singing a secret from them all i cannot forgive you for not having at least told me of it said mary 
and what was there to tell my dearest mary you that are used to such playing as that of elizabeth and lucy would have had fair cause to laugh at me had i volunteered to amuse you in their stead i don't know how that may be said lucy what colonel hubert talked about was your singing do you think you can sing as well as me it is a difficult question to answer lucy replied agnes with the most ingenuous innocence but perhaps i might one of these days if i were as well instructed as you are well my dear that is confessing something at any rate said lucy slightly colouring i am sure i should be very happy to have you in a duet with me only i suppose you have not been taught to take a second oh yes i think i could sing second replied agnes with great simplicity but i have not been much used to it because in all our duets miss wilmot always took the second part and who is miss wilmot my dear said mrs peters the daughter of the clergyman mamma where agnes was educated replied mary here comes mr stephenson exclaimed mrs peters gaily now agnes you positively must go upstairs again and let us hear what you can do i shall be quite delighted for mr stephenson to hear you sing if you really have a voice for i have repeatedly heard him speak with delight of his sister lady stephenson's singing then i am sure that is a reason for never letting him hear mine said agnes who was beginning to feel very restless and longing as ardently for the solitude of her closet in order to take a review of all the events of the morning as colonel hubert for the freedom of the downs but the friends around her were much too kind and much too dear for any whims or wishes of her own to interfere with what they desired and when upon the entrance of frederick they all joined in beseeching her to give them one song she yielded and followed meekly and obediently to the pianoforte she certainly did not sing now as she had done before the fervour the enthusiasm was past yet nevertheless the astonishment and delight of her auditors were unbounded praises and reproaches were blended with the thanks of her female friends who forgetting that they had never invited her performance seemed to think her having so long concealed her talent a positive injury and injustice but in the raptures of frederick stephenson there was no mixture of reproach he seemed wrapped in an ecstasy of admiration and love the exact amount of which was pretty fairly appreciated by every one who listened to him except herself a knavish speech sleeps not so surely in a foolish ear as a passionate rhapsody in one that is indifferent our agnes was by no means dull of apprehension on most occasions but the incapacity she showed for understanding the real meaning of nineteen speeches out of every twenty addressed to her by frederick was remarkable it is probable indeed that indifference alone would hardly have sufficed to constitute a defence so effectual against all the efforts he made to render his feelings both intelligible and acceptable preoccupation of heart and intellect may account for it better but whatever the cause of this insensibility it certainly existed and in such a degree as to render this enforced exhibition and all the vehement praises that followed it most exceedingly irksome a greater proof of this could hardly be given than by her putting a stop to it at last by saying if you really wish me to sing a song to-night my dear mrs peters you must please to let me go now or i think i shall be so hoarse as to make it impossible this little stratagem answered perfectly and at once brought her near to the solitude for which she was pining wish you to sing to-night petite said mrs peters clasping her little hands with delight i rather think i shall i have had the terror of mrs armstrong before my eyes for the last fortnight and i think mary that we have a novelty here that may save us from the faint praise usually accorded by her connoisseurship i imagine we have mamma replied mary who was in every way delighted by the discovery of this unknown talent in her favourite but agnes is right she must really sing no more now you have had no walk to-day agnes have you kindly adding if you like it i will put on my bonnet again and take a stroll with you agnes blushed when she replied no i have not time to walk to-day i must go home now much as she might have done if instead of intending to take a ramble with her thoughts she had been about to enjoy a tete-a-tete -tete promenade with the object of them at least we will walk home with you replied her friend and accordingly the two eldest girls and mr stephenson accompanied her to sion row ungrateful agnes it was with a feeling of joy that made her heart leap that she watched the departure of her kind friends and of him too who would have shed his blood for her with gladness in order that in silence and solitude she might live over again the moments she had passed with hubert 
moments which in her estimation outweighed in value whole years of life without him dear and precious was her little closet now there was nothing within it that ever tempted her aunt to enter her retreat therefore was secure and deeply did she enjoy the conviction that it was so it was not petrarch it was not shakespeare no nor spencer's fairyland in which when fancy free she used to roam for hours of most sweet forgetfulness that now chained her to her solitary chair and kept her wholly unconscious of the narrow walls that hemmed her in but what a world of new and strange thoughts it was amidst which she soon lost herself possibilities conjectures hopes such as had never before entered her head arose within her as with a singular mixture of distinctness of memory and confusion of feeling she lived again through every instant of the period during which colonel hubert had been in her presence and of that more thrilling still as she meditated upon it when she unconsciously had been in his how anxiously she recalled her attitude the careless disorder of her hair and the unmeasured burst of enjoyment to which she had yielded herself how every song she had sung passed in review before her her graces her roulades her childish trials of what she could effect all seemed to rise in judgment against her and her cheeks tingled with the blushes they brought yet in the midst of this perhaps quote, a sense of self-approving power mixed with her busy thought end quote and she felt that she was not sorry he had heard her sing then came the glowing picture of the few short moments that followed the discovery the look that she had seen fixed upon her the voice that trembled as he asked to be forgiven his flushed cheek the agitation yes the agitation of his manner of the stately hubert's manner as he approached as he stood near as he looked at as he spoke to her it was so she knew it she had seen it she had felt it how strange is the constitution of the human mind and how mutually dependent are its faculties and feelings on each other the same girl who was so earthly dull as to be unable to perceive the undisguised adoration of frederick stephenson was now wrapped in a delirium of happiness from having read what probably no other mortal eye could see in the involuntary workings of colonel hubert's features for a few short instants while offering an apology which he could hardly avoid making End of chapter seven volume two chapter eight of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight some farther particulars respecting the state of mrs barnaby's heart tender doubts and fears on the part of the major all set to rest by the gentle kindness of the widow some accounts of mrs peter's concert and of the terrible events which followed it we have left the widow barnaby too long and must hasten back to her there was altogether a strange mixture of worldly wisdom and of female folly in her character for first one and then the other preponderated as circumstances occurred had a man richer than she believed the fascinating major to be proposed to her even at the very tenderest climax of his courtship there is no doubt in the world but she would have accepted him but when all her pecuniary anxieties were lulled into a happy doze by the pleasing statements of messrs william and maintry her love-making propensities awoke she was again the martha compton of silverton and became so exceedingly attached to the major's society that neither mrs peter's concert nor any other engagement in which he did not share could have compensated for one of those delightful tete-a-tete -tete evenings during which agnes enjoyed the society of her friends when major allen saw the invitation card from rodney place lying on the table he said do you intend to go dearest have you a card major was the reply and when the rejoinder produced a negative she added then most assuredly i shall not go a degree of fidelity that was very satisfactory to the major who began to discover that his newness in the society of clifton was wearing off and that he was eyed askance whenever he ventured to appear where gentlemen assembled a thousand fond follies of course diversified these frequent tete-a-tete -tete. and upon one occasion the major in a sudden burst of jealous tenderness declared that notwithstanding the many proofs of affection she had granted him there was one without which he could not be satisfied as his dreams perpetually tormented him with visions of rivals who succeeded in snatching her from him oh major what folly exclaimed the lady have you not yet learned to read my heart but what is there foolish as you are 
what is there that i could refuse to you that it was not inconsistent with my honour to grant your honour beautiful juno know you not that your honour is dearer to me than my own what i would ask my beloved martha can attach no disgrace to you but in fact i shall not know a moment cease till you have given me a promise of marriage i know my love that you have relations here who will leave no stone unturned to prevent our union and the idea that they may succeed distracts me will you forgive this weakness and grant what i implore you know i will foolish man but i will have your promise in return or you will think my love less fervent than your own returned the widow playfully to this the major made no objection and so in mary's sport these promises were signed and exchanged amidst many lover-like jestings on their own folly this happened just three days before the eventful concert and in the interval major allen received a letter from his friend maintry who was still at bath requesting him to join him there in order to give him the advantage of his valuable advice on a matter of great importance it was of course with extreme reluctance that he tore himself away but it was a sacrifice demanded by friendship and he would make it as he told the widow on condition that she would rescind her refusal to mrs peters and pass the evening of his absence at her house she agreed to this and he left her only in time to enable her to dress for the party the being accompanied by her aunt was a considerable drawback to any pleasure agnes had anticipated from the evening and the stroke came upon her by surprise for mrs barnaby did not deem it necessary to stand on such ceremony with her sister as to ask leave to come after having been once invited mrs peters looked vexed and disconcerted when she entered but perceiving the anxiety with which agnes was watching to see how she bore it she recalled her smiles placed her prodigiously fine sister-in-law on a sofa with two other dowagers desired mr peters to go and talk to her and then seizing upon agnes led her among the party of amateurs who were indulging in gossip and tea at a snug table in the second drawing-room she was immediately introduced as a young friend who would prove a great acquisition and two or three songs in her own old-fashioned style were assigned pretty nearly without waiting for her consent to her performance but with an observation from mrs peters that she could not refuse because they were the very songs she had sung when mr stephenson was there in the morning all this was said and done in a bustle and a hurry and agnes carried off captive to the region where the business of the evening was already beginning with the tuning of instruments and the arrangement of desks before she well knew what she intended to do or say she would have felt the embarrassment more had her mind been fully present to the scene but it was not she knew that mr stephenson and his friend were expected and no spot of earth had much interest for her at that moment except the doorway her suspense lasted not long however for they soon entered together and then her heart bounded the colour varied on her cheek and her whole frame trembled mr stephenson was by her side in a moment but she was conscious of this only sufficiently to make her feel a pang because colonel hubert had not followed him far from approaching her indeed he seemed to place himself studiously at a distance and instantly a deep gloom appeared in the eyes of agnes to have fallen upon every object the lights were dim every instrument out of tune and the civilities of mr stephenson so extremely troublesome that she thought if they continued she must certainly leave the room the overture began and she was desired to sit down in the place assigned her but this as she found left her open on one side to the pertinacious whisperings of mr stephenson and with a movement of irritation quite new to her she got up again with her cheeks burning to ask for a place in the very middle of a row of ladies who could not comply with her request without real difficulty as soon as she had reached her new station she raised her eyes and looked towards the spot where she had seen colonel hubert place himself there he was still and moreover his eyes were evidently fixed upon her why will he not speak to me mentally exclaimed poor agnes or why does he so look at me it would not have been difficult for colonel hubert to have given an answer while they were taking coffee together half an hour before they set off frederick stephenson told his friend that his fate would that night be decided for he had made up his mind to propose to miss willoughby colonel hubert started of course frederick you do not decide upon this without being pretty certain what the answer will be was the reply of colonel hubert you know the definition sylvius gives of love returned frederick it is to be all made of faith and service and so am i for agnes wherefore as my service is and shall be perfect so also shall be my faith nor will i ever submit myself to the misery of doubting 
either she is mine at once or i fly where i can never see her more after this colonel hubert very naturally preferred looking on from a distance to making any approach that might disturb the declared purpose of his friend bystanders see most is an old proverb and all such speak truly frederick notwithstanding his perfect service was not by many a degree so near discovering the true state of miss willoughby's feelings as his friend not indeed that colonel hubert discovered anything relating to himself but he saw weariness and distaste in the movement of agnes's head and the mournful expression of her face even before the decisive manoeuvre by which she escaped from him who was only waiting for an opportunity of confessing himself to be all made of adoration duty and observance an indescribable sensation of pleasure tingled through the veins of colonel hubert as he observed this but the next moment his heart reproached him with a bitter pang am i then a traitor to him who has so frankly trusted me thought he no by heaven poor frederick angel as she is he well deserves her for from the very first he has thought of her and her only while i the study of her aunt's absurdities i deem the more attractive speculation of the two agnes you are avenged the good-humoured frederick meantime though foiled in his hope of engrossing her quickly found consolation in listening to miss peters who confided to him all her doubts and fears respecting the possibility of her friend's finding courage to sing before so large an audience for god's sake do not plague her about it said he though to be sure such a voice as hers would be enough to embellish any concert in the world it is only on mamma's account replied mary that i am anxious for it she has been so disappointed about miss roberts i wish after lucy's next duet with james while elizabeth is accompanying the violoncello that you would contrive to get near her where she is trying to keep out of the way poor thing and tell her that my mother wishes to speak to her frederick readily undertook the commission not ill-pleased to be thus confirmed in his belief that she had not run away from him but for some other reason which he had not before understood miss peters was far from imagining what an effectual means she had hit upon for making her friend agnes take a place among the performers she had continued to sit during the long duet triumphing in the clever management that had placed her out of the way of everybody and perfectly aware though she by no means appeared to watch him steadily that colonel hubert did not feel at all more gay or happy than herself but lo just at the moment indicated by mary the smiling bowing handsome frederick stephenson contrived civilly and silently to make his way between crowded rows of full-dressed ladies to the place where agnes fancied herself in such perfect security he delivered his message but not without endeavouring to make her understand how superlatively happy the commission had made him this was too much to sit within the same room that held colonel hubert without his taking the slightest notice of her and that too after all the sweet delusive visions of the morning was quite dreadful enough without having to find answers for words she did not hear and dress her face in smiles when she was so very much disposed to weep i will sing every song they will let me thought she ill or well it matters not now i will bear anything but being talked to giving the eager messenger nothing but a silent nod in return for all his trouble agnes again rose and made her way to mrs peters it chanced that mary lucy and one or two other ladies were in consultation with her at a part of the room exactly within sight of mrs barnaby who having found her neighbours civilly disposed to answer all her questions had thus far remained tolerably contented and quiet but the scene she now witnessed aroused her equally to jealousy and astonishment mrs peters who from the moment she had deposited her on the sofa had never bestowed a single word upon her but on the contrary kept very carefully out of her way had hitherto been supposed by her self-satisfied sister-in-law to be too much occupied in arranging the progress of the musical performance to have any time left to bestow upon her relations yet now she saw her in the centre of the room devoting her whole attention to agnes evidently presenting her to one or two of the most elegant looking among her company and finally taking her by the hand as if she had been the most important personage present and leading her with smiles and an air of the most flattering attention to the pianoforte who is that beautiful girl ma'am said one of mrs barnaby's talkative neighbours thinking perhaps that she had a right in her turn to question a person who had so freely questioned her what girl ma'am returned mrs barnaby for use so lessens a marvel that she had become almost unconscious of the uncommon loveliness of her niece or at any rate was too constantly occupied by other concerns to pay much attention to it 
the young lady in black crape whom mrs peters has just led to the instrument upon my word i think she is the most beautiful person i ever saw oh that's my niece ma'am and i'm sure i don't know what nonsense my sister peters has got in her head about her i hope she is not going to pretend to play without asking my leave it is time i should look after her and so saying the indignant mrs barnaby arose determined upon sharing the notice at least if not the favour bestowed upon her dependent kinswoman but she was immediately compelled to reseat herself by the universal hush that buzzed around her for at that moment the superb voice of agnes burst upon the room and startled the dull ear of the least attentive listener in it the effect was so wholly unlooked for and so great that the demonstration of it might naturally have been expected to overpower so young a performer miss peters therefore the moment the song was over hastened to her friend expecting to find her agitated trembling and in want of an arm to support her but instead of this she found agnes perfectly tranquil apparently unconscious of having produced any sensation at all in the company at large and in fact looking for the first time since she entered the room happy and at her ease the cause of this could only be found where miss peters never thought of looking for it namely in the position and countenance of colonel hubert he had not indeed yet spoken much to her but enough at least to convince her that he was not more indifferent than in the morning and in short enough to raise her from the miserable state of dejection and annoyance which made her fly with such irritated feelings from the attentions of frederick to such a state of joyous hopefulness as made her almost giddily unmindful of every human being around her save one though agnes had restlessly left the place when she had first seen colonel hubert ensconce himself in a corner apparently as far from her as possible she chose another equally convenient for tormenting herself by watching him and for perceiving also that nothing save his own will and pleasure detained him from her from this as we have seen she was again driven by poor frederick and forgetting her shyness and all other minor evils in the misery of being talked to when her heart was breaking she determined upon singing solely to get out of his way her false courage however faded past as she approached the instrument she remembered with a keenness amounting almost to agony those songs of the morning that she had since been rehearsing in spirit in the dear belief that they had charmed away his stately reserve for ever and she was desperately meditating the best mode of making a precipitate retreat when on reaching the spot kept sacred to the performers and their music desks she perceived colonel hubert in the midst of them who immediately placed himself at her side where according to rule he had no business to be and asked her in a whisper if she meant to accompany herself the revulsion of feeling produced by this most unexpected address was violent indeed her whole being seemed changed in a moment her heart beat her eyes sparkled with recovered happiness and she literally remembered nothing but that she was going to sing to him again in answer to his question she said with a smile that made him very nearly as forgetful of all around as herself do you think i had better do it or shall i ask elizabeth no no ask no one he replied and what shall i sing again whispered agnes the last song you sang this morning was the reply orpheus was never inspired by a more powerful feeling than that which now animated the renovated spirit of agnes and she performed as she never had performed before the result was a burst of applause that ought selon les règles to have been overpowering to her feelings yet there she stood blushing a little certainly but looking as light-hearted and as happy as the peri when readmitted into paradise just at this moment and exactly as colonel hubert was offering his arm to lead her back again to a place among the company mrs barnaby feathered rouged ringleted and desperately determined to share the honours of the hour made her way proud in the consciousness of attracting an hundred eyes up to the conspicuous place where agnes stood she had already taken colonel hubert's arm and for an instant he seemed disposed to attempt leading her off in the contrary direction but if he really meditated so bold a measure he was completely foiled for mrs barnaby laying her hand on his in a very friendly way exclaimed in her most fascinating style of vivacity no no colonel you are vastly obliging but i must take care of my own niece if you please she sings just like her poor mother my dear mary she added changing her tone to a sentimental whine i assure you it is almost too much for my feelings and as she said this she drew the unhappy agnes away having thrown her arm around her waist 
while she kissed her affectedly on the forehead colonel hubert hovered about her for a few minutes but whatever might be the fascinations that attracted him they were apparently not strong enough to resist another personal attack from mrs barnaby what a crowd she exclaimed suddenly turning towards him do colonel give me your arm and we will go and eat some ice in the other room upon which he suddenly retreated among the throng and in two minutes had left the house it is true that at the moment the widow so audaciously asked for his arm frederick stephenson was just presenting his to agnes which it is possible might have added impulse to the velocity of this sudden exit but whichever was the primary feeling both together were more than he could bear and accordingly like many other conquered heroes he sought safety in flight of what happened in that room during the rest of the evening poor agnes could have given no account to sing again she assured her friends was quite beyond her power and she looked so very pale and so very miserable as she said this that they believed she had really over-exerted herself and delighted by the brilliant success of her one song permitted her to remain unmolested by further solicitations frederick stephenson also doubted not that the unusual effort she had made before so large a party was the cause of her evident dejection though he could not but feel that the appearance and manner of her aunt were likely enough to increase this but at all events it was no time to breathe into her ear the tale of love he had prepared for it so after asking miss peters if he should be likely to find her friend at rodney place on the following morning and receiving from her a cordial oh yes certainly he also took his leave more in love than ever and though mortified by the disappointment this long expected evening had brought him as sanguine as ever in his hopes for the morrow mrs barnaby was one of the last guests that departed as next to the pleasure of being made love to the gratification of finding herself in a large party with the power of calling the giver of it her dear sister ranked highest in her present estimation agnes was anxiously waiting for her signal to depart but no sooner was she shut up in the fly with her than she heartily wished herself back again for a torrent of scolding was poured forth upon her as unexpected as it was painful and it is thus ungrateful viper as you are that you reward my kindness never have you deigned to tell me that you could sing no you wicked wicked creature you leave me to find it out by accident while your new friends or rather new strangers are made your confidants while i am to sit by and look like a fool because i never heard of it before it was only because there was a pianoforte there aunt i cannot sing without one ungrateful wretch reproaching me with not spending my last shilling in buying pianofortes but i will tell you miss what your fine singing shall end in you shall go upon the stage mark my words you shall go upon the stage miss willoughby and sing for your bread no husband of mine shall ever be taxed to maintain such a mean-spirited ungrateful conceited upstart as you are agnes attempted no farther explanation and the silent tears these revilings drew were too well in accordance with her worn-out spirits and sinking heart to be very painful she only longed for her closet and the unbroken stillness of night that she might shed them without fear of interruption but this was destined to be a night of disappointments for even this melancholy enjoyment was denied her on arriving at their lodgings the door was opened by the servant of the house and when mrs barnaby imperiously demanded where is my maid where is jerningham she was told that jerningham had gone out and was not yet returned now jerningham was an especial favourite with her mistress being a gossip and a sycophant of the first order and the delinquency of not being come home at very nearly one o'clock in the morning elicited no expression of anger but a good deal of alarm dear me what can have become of her poor dear girl i fear she must have met with some accident what o'clock was it when she went out such questionings lasted till the stairs were mounted and the lady had entered her bedroom but no sooner did she reach the commode and placed her candle upon it than she uttered a tremendous scream followed by exclamations which speedily explained to agnes and the servant the misfortune that had befallen her i am robbed i am ruined look here look here my box broken open and every farthing of money gone all my forks too all my spoons and my cream jug and my mustard pot i am ruined i am robbed but you shall be answerable 
the mistress of the house shall be answerable you must have let the thieves in you must for the house-door was not broke open the girl of the house looked exceedingly terrified and asked if she had not better call up her mistress to be sure you had you fool do you think i am going to sleep in a room where thieves have been suffered to enter while i was out how do i know but they may be lurking about still waiting to murder me the worthy widow to whom the house belongs speedily joined the group in nightcap and bedgown and listened half awake to mrs barnaby's clamorous account of her misfortune as soon as she began to understand the statement which was a good deal encumbered by lamentations and threats the quiet little old woman without appearing to take the least offence at the repeated assertion that she must have let the thieves in herself turned to her servant and said is the lady's maid come in sally no ma'am said sally she has never come back since she went out with a gentleman's servant as come to fetch her then you may depend upon it ma'am that tis your maid as have robbed you said the landlady my maid what jerningham impossible she is the best girl in the world an innocent creature that i had away from school tis downright impossible and i will never believe it well ma'am said the widow let it be who it will it won't be possible to catch him to-night and i would advise you to go to bed for the poor young lady looks pale and frightened and to-morrow morning ma'am i would recommend your asking mr peters what is best to be done and how am i to be sure that there are no thieves in the house now cried mrs barnaby open the door of your closet agnes and look under the beds and you mrs crocker you must go into the drawing-room and downstairs and upstairs and everywhere before i lay my poor dear head upon my pillow i don't choose to have my throat cut i promise you good heavens what will major allen say i don't think ma'am that we should any of us like to have our throats cut replied mrs crocker and luckily there is no great likelihood of it i fancy good night ladies and without waiting for any further discussion the sleepy mistress of the mansion crept back to bed her handmaiden followed her example and agnes was left alone to receive upon her devoted head the torrent of lamentations by which the bereaved mrs barnaby gave vent to her sorrows during great part of the night on the following morning the widow took mrs crocker's very reasonable advice and repaired to rodney place in time to find mr peters before he set off on his daily walk to bristol agnes pale fatigued and heavy-hearted accompanied her and so striking was the change in her appearance from what it had been the day before that those of the party round the breakfast-table who best loved her were much more pleased than pained when they learned that the cause of her bad night and consequent ill looks was her aunt's having been robbed of nearly a hundred pounds and a few articles of plate they were too judicious however to mention their satisfaction and the sorrows of the widow received from all the party a very suitable measure of condolence mr peters indeed did much more than condole with her for he cordially offered his assistance and it was soon settled by his advice that mrs barnaby should immediately accompany him to the mayor and afterwards proceed according to the instructions of a lawyer to whom he immediately dispatched a note requesting that he would meet them forthwith before the magistrate the carriage was then ordered agnes by the advice of all parties was left at rodney place and mrs barnaby somewhat comforted but still in great tribulation set off in her dear sister's coach her best consolation to testify before the mayor of bristol not only that she had been robbed but that there certainly was some reason to suppose her maid jerningham the thief mr peters found his lawyer ready to receive them who after hearing the lady's statement obtained a warrant for the apprehension of elizabeth jacks and of william blank surname unknown groom or valet or both to major allen lodging in gloucester row clifton the widow had very considerable scruples concerning the implication of this latter individual but having allowed that she thought he must be the gentleman's servant spoken of by mrs crocker's maid as having accompanied jerningham when she left the house she was assured that it would be necessary to include him and she finally consented on its being made manifest to her that if he proved innocent there would be no difficulty whatever in obtaining his release mrs barnaby was then requested accurately to describe the persons of her maid and her supposed companion which she did very distinctly and with the less difficulty because the persons of both were remarkable there wasn't another man likely to be in her company was there ma'am said a constable who was in attendance in the office no replied mrs barnaby confidently i don't know any one at all likely to be with her 
i am almost sure that she had not any other acquaintance but the man might observed another official that's true rejoined the first and therefore i strongly suspect that i saw the girl and the man too enter a house on the quay just fit for such sort of company but there was another fellow along with them then we will charge you with the warrant miles said the magistrate if you can succeed in taking them into custody at once it is highly probable that you may be able to recover the property this hint rendered the widow extremely urgent that no time should be lost and in case the constable should succeed in finding them at the place he had named she consented to remain in a room attached to the office that no time might be lost in identifying the parties there will be no harm i suppose in taking the other fellow on suspicion if i find them still together said the constable adding i rather think i know something of that t'other chap already he received authority to do this and then departed leaving mrs barnaby her faithful squire mr peters and the lawyer seated on three stools in a dismal sort of apartment within the office the lady at least being in a state of very nervous expectation this position was not a pleasant one but fortunately it did not last long for in considerably less than an hour they were requested to return into the office the three prisoners being arrived mr peters gave the lady his arm and they entered by a door exactly facing the spot on which stood the three persons just brought in with the constable and two attendant officers behind them the group as expected consisted of two men and a girl which latter was indeed the tall and slender betty jacks and no other the man at her left hand was william the major's civil groom and he at her right was no it was impossible yet she could not mistake it must be and in fact it was that pattern of faithful friendship captain maintry mrs barnaby's agitation was now beyond all suspicion of affectation very considerable and his worship obligingly ordered a glass of water and a chair which having been procured and profited by he asked her if she knew the prisoners yes she answered with a long-drawn sigh can you point them out by name the girl is my maid jer betty jacks that man is william major allen's groom and that other you had better stop there interrupted the self-styled captain or you may chance to say more than you know you had better be silent i promise you said the magistrate pray ma'am do you know that person did you ever see him before yes i have seen him before replied mrs barnaby who was pale in spite of her rouge for the recollection of all the affectionate intimacy she had witnessed between this man and her affianced major turned her very sick and it was quite as much as she could do to articulate i should be sorry ma'am to trouble you with any unnecessary questions said the magistrate but i must beg you to tell me if you please where it is you have seen him and what he is called i saw him in the mall at clifton sir replied mrs barnaby and many an honest man besides me may have been seen in the mall at clifton said the soi-disant captain maintry laughing and you have never seen him anywhere else ma'am no sir never pray was he then in company with that groom no replied the widow faltering maintry laughed again you cannot then swear that you suspect him of having robbed you no sir here the constable whispered something in the ear of the magistrate who nodded and then resumed his examination did you hear this man's name mentioned madam when you saw him in the mall yes sir i did that has nothing to do with the present business interrupted maintry and therefore you have no right to ask it i suspect that you have called yourself in this city by more names than one replied the magistrate and i have a right to discover this if i can by what name did you hear him called when you saw him at clifton ma'am i heard him called captain maintry captain indeed these fellows are all captains and majors i think said the magistrate making a memorandum of the name mrs barnaby's heart sunk within her she remembered the promise of marriage and that so acutely as almost to make her forget the business that brought her there the magistrate and the lawyer however were less oblivious and proceeded in the usual manner to discover whether there were sufficient grounds of suspicion against any of the parties to justify committal the very first question addressed to betty jacks settled the business for she began crying and sobbing at a piteous rate and said if mistress will forgive me i'll tell her all about it and a great deal more too and twasn't my fault nor williams neither have so much as joe purdams for he set us on 
and she indicated joe purdham with a finger which as her lengthy arm reached within an inch of his nose could not be mistaken as to the person to whom it intended to act as index but had this been insufficient the search instituted on the persons of the trio would have supplied all the proof wanted very nearly all the money was discovered within the lining of purdham's hat the pockets of betty were heavy with forks and spoons and the cream jug and mustard pot carelessly enveloped each in a pocket handkerchief were lodged upon the person of william in a word the parties were satisfactorily identified and committed to prison the property of mrs barnaby was in a fair way of being restored and her very disagreeable business at bristol done and over leaving nothing but a ride back in her sister's coach to be accomplished mr peters offered his arm to lead her out and with a dash of honest triumph at having so ably managed matters said well madam i hope you are pleased with the termination of this business what a question for mrs barnaby to answer pleased was she pleased pleased at having every reason in the world to believe that she had given a promise of marriage to the friend and associate of a common thief but the spirit of the widow did not forsake her and after one little hysterical gasp she replied by uttering a thousand thanks and a million assurances that nothing could possibly be more satisfactory she was not however quite in a condition to meet the questionings which would probably await her at rodney place and as mr peters did not return in the carriage she ordered the man to set her down at sion row she could not refuse to mrs crocker the satisfaction of knowing that jerningham was the thief that jerningham was committed to prison and that she was bound over to prosecute but it was all uttered as briefly as possible and then she shut herself in her drawing-room to take counsel with herself as to what could be done to get her out of this terrible scrape without confessing either to mr peters or any one else that she had ever got into it for the remainder of the day she might easily plead illness and fatigue to excuse her seeing anybody and as it was not till the day following that she expected the return of the major she had still some hours to meditate upon the ways and means of extricating herself towards night she became more tranquil for she had made up her mind what to do she would meet him as fondly as ever and then so play her game as to oblige him to let her look at the promise she had given once within reach of my hand thought she the danger will be over this scheme so effectually cheered her spirits that when agnes returned home in the evening she had no reason whatever to suspect that her aunt had anything particularly disagreeable upon her mind for she only called her a fool twice and threatened to send her upon the stage three times End of chapter eight